I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Okay, everybody. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through this one. I'm, uh, springtime. It, it's springtime. We're laughing. To, to Sleep deprivation is That's setting exactly in right. already. That's exactly right. Sleep deprivation. It's a brutal this time of year, and I've got a month left. Yeah, you do. Dudley, you got a smile on your face, a twinkle in your eye. Yeah. You look like you're excited. It's spring. It's spring. How can spring, you not be excited? Spring has sprung. Yep. Yeah, it came quick. We it got did. Mac 3.0 over here. 3.5, I should say. Yeah. How, how's tennis going, Mac? You know, uh, about as good as my turkey season so far. Oh. Yeah. With that womp, 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 womp. Let us know next time we'll come <laughs> cheer for you. That might help. Bobby's just been playing his violin for you so much. Yeah. Yeah, we do need to go over there and watch him play. That'd be, That'd be a lot of fun. That'd be fun. Yeah. He we is, can make an episode about that. I live through the, the I live through the years of watching my kids compete with Mac and he is a He's an athlete. Relentless competitor too. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Relentless. <laughs> Hopefully, you don't mess up your Achilles tendon. So, are again. you playing? Are you a like a better than a three point five? Or are you not a three point five? I feel like I'm playing up a little bit, uh, but I, I, I go in confident, kind of like in the turkey woods, and then most of the time get disappointed. But you just started really playing tennis hardcore, didn't you? I did. See, I did. This is like a new thing. Yeah, it's another. Well, okay. That's pretty. It's pretty good to be a three five. It's just you're just starting it, isn't it? I, you know, I don't know. I, Y'all should play. I, we, I, <laughs> nah, I probably shouldn't. I'm a one point <laughs> over. Nah. You need to play Daniel's Caroline. Who you need to play? Mm. She, Daniel. The first time they played, he was like, "Oh my gosh, that was embarrassing." My girlfriend <laughs> just whipped my tail so bad in tennis. That's how my wife is. She could run me over the court. Well, so today's podcast. We Turning, to, I'm looking over here on the couch. We Our got good a, buddy. We got a man that I have wanted to have on the podcast since we started this. His name is Barry Smith. In the house, sound the horns. He, That's right. He he, he is uh, no introduction. He is the man. He's a legend from the state of Alabama when it comes to fish mm-hmm. and a lot of other things. I, I might add, but but Barry is a fishery scientist. He had a career in fisheries. Started with the state of Alabama. Moved on to. It was a private industry, the American Sport Fish Hatchery. You and Don Keller founded that and worked your tails off for a number of years. He's the first guy I ever knew about to kill a turkey with a 410. He did it. Ooh. I bet he did it 25 years ago. Like 20 years with ago. With lead. Yeah. I wow. mean, that's, right. that's a big fun. difference. That is a big difference. Basically, all he does Good is fly point, fish. Though. And he, I mean, he likes challenges. And he is a, when it comes to hunting and fishing, he's yep. He's good. Yep. He's, he's really a, good. He's got the salt water down, too. Hey. Right? He does. He could be on the Dos Equis bottle. <laughs> so so you, you hear, Barry, he's very soft-spoken. Mm-hmm. Let me just say this. So he's very soft-spoken. He is a Southern gentleman. He's a Christian. He's a deacon at the church. In, in Montgomery, the, 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 the Methodist church there, he ran the camera crew. He just If the church doors were open, he's there. Great guy. But let me just tell you all, <laughs> if you're in the bow of the boat with him and he spots a redfish out there, and he tells you, there it is, it's 36 inches, there it is. And you make a couple of false casts, and then you lay your crab at the tail of that fish instead of the mouth of that fish. You will get the worst cussing you ever got <laughs> in your life. <laughs> he changes his whole personnel, personality. I've, seen, I've seen you do that on occasion, Bobby, in the bass pond or on the turkey woods. Uh, Barry, we're glad to have you here. No well, doubt. Thank you. Thank you. This one's been a long time coming. So it is. I've had several invites, and unfortunately, it's just been. Uh, I'm a busy man, so it's hard to get away sometimes. So the fish pond world, there's just there. It's a when guys can manage their pond and do it right, fertilize, stock the right fish continuously. I guess stock some kind of feeder fish. It's a whole different world, isn't it? It is, and a lot of people don't realize that. Like a lot of other things, you know, they think it's you, you just got it, and it just magically develops itself. And occasionally, by accident, that happens. But most of the time, if you've got really good fishing in your lake or pond, 
you put in a lot of effort to achieve that. Yeah. It's just like having some turkey woods, you know? Yeah. You know, I've, I've said it forever in just my top material possession in life is land and, you know, doing this, you know, hence gamekeepers. And I've said it forever. People that are looking at their first piece of land or buying a piece of land or getting a piece, I, the number one thing I would do, looking back on my experience, is build the fish pond. I can't agree more. Man. I mean, uh, you know, growing up turkey hunting, uh, that was the first thing we thought of when we were coming out of the woods was yeah. let's go catch some fish. Mm-hmm. Exactly uh, right. So, so Barry, how did you get into the fisheries business? It's kind of a long story. You know, I started out uh, not really sure whether I was going to get to go to college or not, but I kind of worked my way through. You can't do that today, but back in the old days when things were a little cheaper, you could you could do that. And uh, I was interested both in wildlife and fisheries. And uh, and actually, I, I started to get a, a dual degree, but I kind of gravitated toward uh, fisheries. And, uh, hey, lots of things happened between now and Back in the old days, so yeah, here I here I am. A couple of weeks ago, we had a guy on that was responsible for restocking turkeys across the state of yeah. of, of Mississippi. And Mr. Barry, Barry, when you worked in Alabama, y'all were doing some restocking some fisheries around the state pretty heavily at that time as well, weren't you? We were, yeah. Back when I was with the state, we uh, we were interested in a lot of things, and a lot of things that, that at that time was kind of progressive. So, you know, we we wanted to introduce Florida bass, for instance, and uh, get those in a lot of the reservoirs. And and then uh, we were interested in hybrid striving bass, and and we we kind of developed that program. And, uh, you know, we we were known for a lot of things way back in the day, but uh, you know, basically we were, we were into pond management or lake management, private lake management. And uh, a lot of those things came from uh, from Auburn, where most of us went to school over there to get educated in in fishery science, and and we just kind of proceeded from there. And so we we did a lot of public water stockings back in the day. And my my mentor and my boss at that time was Sam Spencer, and he was a very progressive thinker. And uh, we got into a lot of things that uh, that just had not been done before, and a lot of those were very successful. You know, this time of year, we're thinking turkeys. Yeah. And, and, but there's a lot of people that are thinking crappies. Oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. So, That's why I'm such a bad crappie person. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, can you tell us what's going on with the crappies right now and the temperature guys need to think about if, sure. if, if they're for like public water, rivers and stuff? Well, there are a couple of things that are associated with crappie spawning, and crappie spawning is one of the times when, you know, back in the day, is when we used to find those fish up on the banks, both in private ponds and in public waters, or at least trying to move up to where they can begin spawning. And so that happens in the springtime, and uh, it happens this time of year. And typically in March, around the full moon, and the moon does have some influence on spawning in a lot of different species, so, you know, a week before, a week after the full moon, and we're coming up on the full moon now, and uh, during that time and when the temperatures begin to elevate to what the threshold for spawning is for these fish, then that's, that starts in the time. And then it, it lasts for maybe a month or so. And then uh, as as that ends, then the crappie move off the bank and they move out to deeper water. All you who are crappie fishermen know how this works, and you... You go look for some treetops that are in 10 or 12, 15 feet of water, depending on what lake you're fishing in. And uh, and you find those things after they spawn, post-spawn, all congregated in, in a school. But what a lot of people don't know is that before the spawning takes place, the males move in first, just kind of like the bass. And then they kind of prepare the beds. And so the area for the females to come in, but... The females are not far from the males. And if, if you're fishing in a reservoir or, or a pond that's, that's got sloughs or little pockets in there, a lot of times these fish are schooled up out in those pockets, out in the middle of those things, deep. And if you had a depth finder, you can find those things out there, you know, while they're schooled up before they move in. And you hear a lot of people say, well, yeah, call me some black crappie today. You know, those things are... Those things are just so black. They got uh, they got black fins and stuff. Well, that's not necessarily black crappie. 
and that's the fact that a lot of species of fish uh, have characteristics that develop during the spawning season. And this melanistic or black color that develops into the fins are primarily males. Hmm. And so when you're on the bank and catch these things, you know, everybody think, oh, I got me a black crappie, but really it's just a male. Hmm. It could be a white crappie, but they, they develop some melanistic characteristics like that. How about that? And then a female doesn't turn black. Okay, she she doesn't have any melanistic characteristics, and so this is this is a little thing that uh, as a, as a scientist we call sexual dimorphism. A little term I'll throw out to you. <laughs> I've, kind of, heard, kind of, I've heard it before. I've heard that one time. Kind of, I'm, kind of I confused think I've heard mine. Dudley. I know I've it. made the mistake on the black crappie in the past. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you see, it's darker. You assume it's a black crappie. So what you stock for people is black crappie, though, right? Primarily. They're, yeah, there are two different species of crappie, a black crappie and a white crappie. Right. The black crappie do better in, in really in deep reservoirs. The white crappie are found more likely in river run impoundments, like in like in the Alabama River, for instance, in our state. Right. And uh, some of the bigger rivers over here would have more of the white crappie in there. So, yeah, there's, so there's two different species, but if we're stocking it in your pond, Toxie, for instance, right. we would provide black crappie. They do better in the ponds. That's what I thought. Yeah. So. But you got to be careful putting crappie in a pond, don't you? You do, and this is a, this is a mistake that's commonly made by, by pond owners that really don't know any better. You know, you, All of us have, have fished ponds that have good brim, good bass, and good crappie populations, Okay. Sometimes those happen by accident, <laughs> but mm -hmm. if you really want it to happen for intention, then you come in and, and don't let your buddy come back from the river and dump a bucket full of mature males and females in your pond, okay? Because this is the time of the year that's really critical for that mm -hmm. because the crappie are spawning right now, but the bass haven't spawned yet. Okay, they're going to. Their primary spawn will be in April. But the bass is what controls everything in your pond or your private lake. Okay, they control the population, whatever's in there. What happens when you have crappie, if you put in adults, is that they spawn almost a month before the bass do. And those little crappie fry, as they develop into fingerlings, are never small enough for the young of the year bass to, to eat and so they overpopulate. Uh -huh. And this is what causes the major problem. If you come in and stock fingerlings in there, you don't have that problem. Okay. Con conversely, the brim is the perfect partner because they spawn like a month or whatever after the bass. That's right. And the little teeny bass brim fry were perfect for the bass. Huh. Exactly. exactly. The time and other, he taught me that so I can act smart in front of him. <laughs> he taught me that forever ago. So <laughs> yeah. it was from him. And so, uh, you did, though. Um, I just always wanted to do it. There was a place that was, I thought, perfect for to, to kind of create an oxbow or natural type lake because I knew it would flood occasionally once every 10 years, maybe a little bit. But it has some, a little bit of creek drainage in it, not much. But um, I let them handle that. And so, you know, we didn't think it was going to turn out. They stocked brim and crappie first. And then there was so much decaying matter. And then the, the acidity, was, acidity was so high, he said, I'm just gonna wait. I'm not, I'm scared you might lose, but I'm you know they literally that's the that's the kind of service and honesty and integrity. Handled and said, well, drove all the way there a couple of hours to deliver the fish when the guy tested the water. Called Bear. He said, don't charge him anything. Just take them back. It's too big a risk to stock them. Right. And lo and behold, he said they might they might not, but it's just too big a risk to charge you and put and you were gonna put stripers in there with the bass to maintain, right. you know, kind of keep the population down more. And turns out, I think by luck that we didn't do that. Some bass got in there naturally, but it also, when you shocked it and texted it for it, it had some of those grinnel and stuff in there. So I right. think it naturally is, is keeping the population more in check. And it's a, you know, this thing's a half a mile long. Bobby's fished it, loves to fish down yeah. But we got lucky and it turned out great and kind of replicated, you know, what you would find in a natural oxbow lake. And so we love the place. It's a great lake. Now, is it gonna be our best lake to catch a giant bass? No. But there's a healthy population, and they're getting along. I think you can tell me my grin will probably be are helping me. That's that's a predator that controls some of that overpopulation. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. true. Can those things really live in the mud, dried out mud for <laughs> months? Not dried out mud, but they but they can live in a lake that doesn't look like it's inhabitable. 
Yeah. So these are these can be air breathers, and so if you've got what you think no other fish would live in, a grinnell or a bowfin can can live in that muck and stuff. Boy, they so, can bust a spinnerbait, and they're so <laughs> prehistoric looking. Yeah, they, they are. Just look yeah. like a dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> they're lot. They, they will bust a spinnerbait, but they're. You don't want to be handling them. No. They, it, yeah. They're like catching a saltwater fish. Mm-hmm. They're so kind of, you know, so much energy. Yeah, don't try to lip one. See these people? When the clock strikes five, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. They have to do these things. They have to do those things. Enter the all-new LS Tractor MT2 and MT2E, a relentless force of innovation, redesigned with a new hood and cab built for comfort and visibility with enhanced lifting capacity to get the job done. Making these people the ones everyone else calls those people. Visit your local LS tractor dealer today. Moultrie has pioneered the game management category. Today, Moultrie is one of the best-selling brands of feeders and seeders in the world, and they continue to innovate with new technology that gamekeepers will rely on. Moultrie products are always field tested and designed for hunters by hunters, combining forward thinking, innovation with time tested practicality. Moultrie, first in feeders since 1979. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site wide discount at Moultriefeeders.com. Use code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount. So, so going back, so the crappie spawn first, then the bass are second, and then the yeah. brim are going to follow multiple times throughout the summer. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the next thing to spawn in there that's that's native is is, is the shellcracker, okay, yeah. or red ear. It's commonly called a red ear, but most people call them shellcrackers just because they 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 do eat. Chinka pins. Is that yeah, the strawberry well, that you I grew up calling them? Chinka pin. And then huh. that's that's a that's a common name, especially if you get. Mississippi Edge into Louisiana, you know, they're all mm-hmm. chinkle pins in Louisiana. There's no show. Crack. That's the unsung hero of a great pond, too, because uh-huh. they're, they're not the same. You don't necessarily don't eat the fish feed like the bluegills yep. do as much. And and then, you know, you don't really catch them a lot on crickets. It's worms primarily, isn't it? Worms primarily. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. but boy, they are just delicious table fare mm, and so much are. fun to catch. Big, handsome fish, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. They are. And, and the thing about shell cracker that most people don't realize. And and if if you catch some this spring, this is something you can do, okay? When you cut that fish's throat open and look down inside there, you'll see that there's a set of of molars, Hmm. top and bottom, that they use to crush those snails with. Wow. Or any other type of mollusk. And you've, you've caught a thousand of them. But I'll bet you you've never cut one open to look Mm-mm. at that. Mm-mm. So I next time, it. next time you have one, just just take your scissors or a knife and just cut him open, and look in there. You'll see two pads way back in the throat there, and each of those pads have some little uh, tubercular stuff on there that that are hardened. And when they suck that shell that shell in from a snail or any type of mollusk wow. that they can get their mouth on, they just take it and crush it. Hmm. And then they spit the shell out, and then they absorb the meat that's inside there. But you say that's if, if you learn something you new every that, day. You know, well, hey. Shell cracker. Shell cracker. Yeah. Right. I'll ask you Makes a, a lot more sense now. <laughs> it seems like, uh, if I remember right, you were usually used ten percent. Is that about right? That's about right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you're stocking, say the brim or the you know the ninety percent brim, ten percent yeah. shell cracker, tin pan, whatever. It just seems like they maintain that. They don't go away. They will get overpopulated. But it seems like if you do the shocking test or you fish, they seem to be so like in balance all the time, almost. You know, they do. And one of the reasons is because the shellcracker typically have one primary spawn, and that's during the spring, and they spawn a month before the bluegill begin to bed. So there, there is some bedding activity there. Occasionally, you'll get a little crossing there that's not un, unusual to see one that's uh, that's got both bluegill and shellcracker in it you see that occasionally but a hybrid but typically mm. yeah it's, it's a hybrid but typically they spawn a month full moon a month before the bluegill began to begin to bed and are they are they usually deeper than than bluegill when they're spawning 
Not necessarily. You know, what what you will find is that these things will be in uh, little points that have treetops or something. They'll get in those treetops. If you were to if you were to lower that lake and look at it, say like in in June, okay, after the bluegill had made their initial spawn, you'll see the difference in the beds. Okay, the the shellcracker will make a bed as big as a bass. Wow. And the bluegill will make a small bed. Maybe like a teacup, I mean, a little saucer yeah. for a mm-hmm. cup, but the but the shell crackers, especially the bigger ones that that get closer to a three quarters to a pound, will make a bed that will be bigger than a dinner plate, hmm. okay. and they and they will not they will not touch each other. Hmm. The bluegill will bed right next to each other, and you see those beds. You you've seen them in clear ponds. They'll they'll be ten or fifteen or twenty of them or more. And they'll all be touching each other, mm-hmm. just one after another. But the shellcracker, they don't touch. They may be close, but you'll see four or five beds, maybe more than that. But it'll it'll be on a point. Typically, they can be deeper than bluegill, but they'll or if there's a treetop or some limbs or something out there, they'll get in amongst that, and they'll bed inside there. And so they're they're really never. And like a bluegill would pick a nice flat place, and I, I've seen fifty or more beds as you have too, and mm-hmm. uh, you know in these ponds, the shellcracker are different from that. Hmm. And uh, and the other thing that shellcracker like is they like ponds with vegetation. Hmm. Okay, we don't like vegetation in them; mm-hmm. uh, hard to fish. But some what we call as a scientist macro invertebrates, these bigger insects get on. These, this type of vegetation. So just for instance, if you've got Kara or you've got some other, something besides algae in there that grows in there, that's an attachment surface for these insects that shellcracker eat. They'll get snails on there, but they'll also have these larger insects that will attach to that. And uh, that's what that's what shellcracker likes. So if you've got kind of an isolated spot, you know, if it's, I guess the whole lake's covered in something, then they're just spread out randomly anyway. But if you've got a concentrated spot, then that might be your best place to try fishing too, isn't it? It could be. Mm-hmm. Sure could be. I mean, we, we see this a lot, not just in private ponds, but in public reservoirs. <clears throat> For instance, I go up into Tennessee to fish in the spring, usually the first full moon in May, and we catch shellcracker up there. I mean, those that are over a pound. Some of them pound and a half or even closer wow. to two pounds. Big, Yummy. huge shellcracker. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, seem they're... to get bigger in a like a natural environment, whereas mm-hmm. bluegill, you you almost have to manage heavily to get them really big, uh, and they, I, that's just my experience. Well, but, that's that's a correct experience because it it's exactly what happens. And if they've got a good bit of vegetation in in a situation where they live, there's a lot of big succulent insects for them to eat, in addition to snails that get all of these. Things. I can't remember catching one at a at the Brim, the fish feeder. No, they they don't they don't feed on artificial feed very well. You can you can catch some occasionally eating that, but most of the time they don't. So Barry, my dad was a big fisherman, and and he just loved shell crackers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he always used porcupine quills. Right, and and would bounce them just right where they would set up. But and you would watch this as a kid. I can remember just trying, to, and, and I could not hardly see the movement of. The, but he'd say, "You got one." Right, but, but so how is that fish taking it differently? Where you need something so sensitive as a porcupine quill to, to. They, so you're referring to using using it as a cork, as a cork. Right. Okay, yeah. I was as just a letting the listeners sorry. know. Yeah, we, my grand, my my dad did. My uncle, great uncle, yeah. and my granddad yeah, both used porcupine quills for brim in. Yeah, right. So I thought it was just a shellcracker thing. Maybe it's a, it's it's not back in back in the day, back in the old days when you you used to go with your granddaddy, you know, but. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it's a real long time ago. Yeah. And so the, the, a lot of people use this. You know, they use those quills for that. And then you could watch that quill and just mm-hmm. stand up. Straight but, up. But one thing about shellcracker is they, they don't hit that thing hard like a bluegill will. Okay, there's a difference in the way they feed. The shellcracker sucks that up rather than just going after right. it and, and biting it and where you can really feel that thing. So a lot of times just... The way we fish those things a lot of times is, is we'll we'll use a drop shot technique. So you put a little lead on the end, you want to come up from that just a little bit, maybe 12 inches or so, and 
hook a little fly or hook a little worm on there, whatever. And when you drag that through, a lot of times that thing will just stop. And then you just have to pull back on it. You feel resistance, and you go ahead and set the hook. you got something on, on there. Mm. But a bluegill hits that thing. He hits it. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. You know, boom. And you can feel that really well. So yeah. there's a difference in the way that they feed and a difference in the way that they you – know, things that they eat. Making me want to go fishing. Yeah, right? me too. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Lanny just got a pond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just, just got a place. Just got a – Five acre lake. On yeah. So, yeah. cool. Uh, what would you say to somebody that, that's just got a just got one? And I don't think Lane has there been any management ever done on the. Uh, not that I know of. You know, it's been there. I know it's been there probably since the '40s. So it's an old lake. Old totally. lake. Uh, mm -hmm. In a in a river bottom, and it's pretty deep. Um, but it doesn't flood there. Though. No, it does not okay, flood. So it doesn't flood at all. Yeah. Do you need to? Does he need to shock it and see what's going on? That's the best thing to do. You know, you can get an indication out of that if mm -hmm. if you fished it pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. Lanny, probably not you, but yeah. yourself. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you buy some friends over that know how to fish and and get those get those people out there. Yeah. And fish not only for bass, but look for your bluegill and shellcracker mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know, the time to catch shellcracker is in the spring. Okay. Because once you pass that spawning time. Those things are who knows where, but typically out in deeper water mm -hmm. that you would never even think about fishing in. So would you just kind of do it like a wildlife survey? I mean, sure. just X amount. Of, this is how many days we fished, how many times well, we fished, and yeah, this is the keep, breakdown of the species? Yeah, keep track of what you yeah. catch and, and the size range of what you of Which, what you harvested mm -hmm. out of there during your fishing experience so mm -hmm. that you know what size of bluegill you've got. And, and same thing if you catch any shellcracker, but don't fish with crickets, you know. She'll crack them like worms. Gotcha. Gotcha. But, you know, but how's he going to know if he's got some invasive fish he doesn't need? I mean, some of the small fish you might not even catch. I mean, it just seems like to me that's that's in your backyard. Let's all face it. Yeah. Doing it right, you need to do this. I, I wouldn't want to do shocking right boat, sure. shocking boat yeah. survey. Yeah. So, you know, is yeah. that you might have, there might be loaded with crappie you don't even know. Right. If you got them in there, you got a whole different. Right. Set of problems, you know. Well, the other thing I want to like get in front of Barry yeah. is he's going to catch a big old flathead catatfish out of the river, <laughs> no. and his boys are, are, are going to say, "Let's take it." You're no. literally reading all my questions because I was going to ask his, about his, putting flatheads in there. I know, I know the answer to that <laughs> so one. Let's go ahead and. Tell I've him. already yeah. asked him that question before. I can tell you. I mean, okay. you know. <laughs> okay, I, uh, so you've caught a flathead out uh, of the river. My, he's a big flathead guy. That's what he does. Okay, do you notice how wide the mouth is? Oh yeah. Okay. Well. Let me give you an example of how this relates to your lake, okay? A largemouth bass can eat a bluegill about a third of its length. So mm -hmm. if you've got a 12-inch largemouth, it can eat a bluegill between three and four inches, okay? Flathead catfish can eat the size of bluegill you want to fillet and take home. Mmm, that must be why they taste so good. <laughs> <laughs> so they're... They're a very efficient predator, and yeah. their mouth is so wide, they can eat something really big. Hmm. They just turn that thing sideways and suck it in. So you could have seven, eight-inch bluegill in there, and if you had a flathead in there, it could eat those up. The seven or eight inches itself. So yeah. they grow, uh, didn't I hear one time they grow like seven pounds in the first year or something like that? It, Some crazy amount. All that depends on the food supply. Right. So, you know, that's, that's food dependent, but they can grow. At a very rapid rate. So yeah. don't dump any crappie from the river or any flatheads from the no, river. No, don't. don't <laughs> All your plans I know have it. just got well, an X. He wasn't, that, he wasn't that diplomatic when I asked him about it. He said, under no circumstances. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Lenny, I had to tell you, hunting with you, you've got your phone in your pocket. You're constantly checking on X. Yep. Very valuable key features all in those things. It really is. From the compass mode to recent imagery, I mean, it really helps you understand where you are spatially, where you're headed, where a turkey is, where he was. It's a heck of a tool to use in the spring woods. I didn't realize that they're updating these maps every couple of weeks. Yeah, I'd have never known about that clear cut that you were hunting <laughs> if I didn't have that recent imagery. Well, you know, and you could share some waypoints with me. I could share some points with you. You're exactly yeah. right. I mean, it has that capability. It does have that sharing capability which is great you know you're wanting to show me where your goblin turkeys are <laughs> <laughs> oh man you know onyx it's a great app it, it's a great app so guys can go to onyxmaps.com backslash hunt and use code mossy oak to get 20 percent off there you go i'm a big fan of onyx i am too 
I remember a lot of people had catfish ponds when I was growing up. Is anybody doing that anymore? They are, and and there's still some room for catfish in mm-hmm. there. My my suggestion is always this: if you if you've got a small pond like less than an acre, and you want a place for your kids to fish, or even yourself, where you'd like to catch some catfish, maybe have a cat fish fry. One hundred percent. Okay. What I was All right. Aiming so for. don't put them in your ten acre lake. Okay. And the reason is this. Okay. Is that when you if you stock them from somebody who's got some fingerlings, six, eight, ten inches, you put them in there. The first year they're going to grow really nice, and so they're going to be the perfect size that you want to catch and eat. Okay, but then after you had a fish fry or two, then you you that kind of takes you kind of forget about that. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing you know, those catfish are instead of being a pound or a pound and a half. Or have grown to three or four pounds. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, they've grown to five or six or six or eight pounds. And the larger they get, the more difficult they are to catch. Mm-hmm. And once they get above about um, two pounds, they begin to compete with your largemouth for food. Gotcha. Okay. Even if you're feeding, they're, they're possibles. And uh, once they get to that size that they can eat your bluegill, or whatever else you've got in there that your bass are going to eat, then they begin to affect the growth of your bass. Mm-hmm. And so you end up with a lake that you throw out a little feed and you see a dozen of these big catfish that are 8 to 10 pounds that come up. They're on their channels. That's what they normally stock in there. And uh, the next thing you know, you catch one, maybe two, then they quit biting. That's all you catch. You come back next week, see the same thing but they become more and more difficult to catch and they stay in there and they continue to deplete that food supply you have for your bass. So mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons I don't recommend stocking anything in, in lakes any bigger than a, than an acre. Gotcha. And mm-hmm. if you got an acre just dedicated all the way to catfish. Primarily just, catfish. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. You could, could you do a bigger lake with catfish, but only – if you're dedicated to the catfish, or do you think it's yeah, just going to be could. too much? You could. You could just do don't big... expect anything from your other fish. Yeah, well, actually, you could do just a catfish lake if you right, were to. Yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. that, and that's one of the things that you can do. You but can... now you'd have to feed those fish. Yeah. Right? yeah. You can put some forage in there for them, but uh, you probably wouldn't need any bass in there. But what a lot of people don't realize is if you get a catfish-only lake— you get a depression or a piece of a log or a stump or an old tire, those catfish will spawn in there. Mm. And then what's going to eat those little females? Nothing. Nothing. You're right, Toxie. Overpopulated again. Yeah, so then you end up with a bunch of little catfish. It's, it's hard It's hard to get things to work out right, you know, if you've got a larger lake. Hmm. So. So let's do this because I want to get you to tell one of the things that I've always that's always fascinated me about Barry is he may not have invented fish pond fertilizer, but he perfected it. Yes. And can you kind of carry us back to the day when you when this whole process started with you and Don and and, and let's talk about how important it is to fertilize a pond, but then kind of go how you guys got into these really fine ingredients and these specialized micronutrient packages that you developed. Yeah. And let's just kind of go there because that's so important to the health of a pond. Well, it is, and and there's been studies on just fertilizing ponds, okay, since the 1950s, okay. Dr. Homer Schwingle at Auburn was one of the pioneers in this in this thing, and so he had a bunch of small ponds that were replicates, and, and he was really an agronomist, so he was really into replicating stuff so that he could verify what was going on. So one of the things that he discovered was that if you fertilize a pond, you can triple the production of fish in that pond by f- adding fertilizer to it. Hmm. That's a big number. That's a huge That's a big, number. It's a huge number. Man, yeah. 50% is a huge number. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tripling yeah. down. Much less triple. No. Yeah, but tripling. And this That's is all incredible. documented. I mean, he has data to, to, to prove this stuff. And what this fertilizer does, it, it just starts at the basic level, okay, of food production which is really bacteria and insects, okay? And these feed off of, of uh, plankton, phytoplankton. So as you increase the amount of food for those, then you increase the amount of plankton, the amount of insects you produce, and then this 
goes right on up the chain there from the basic uh, production of bluegill to the production of bass because the more bluegill you have and, and the bigger sizes you've got for the bass that you have in there, then the more you can produce. So it's just, it's just a pretty simple thing. So we, so we were around this for a long time, and most of the, most of the original uh, fertilizer stuff was done with granular fertilizer. Yeah, okay. I remember my dad going around with a coffee can and a super triple phosphate. That's right. Yeah. Flinging it out. Flinging it out, okay. Or people had these, like, baskets, and they would put a Platforms. Yeah. And, and, and cut a bag open and lay it on That's more around. advanced. Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's right. <laughs> it, phase is, two. it is more advanced. So what happens a lot of times if you, regardless of whether you're using uh, 2025 or whether you're using triple super phosphate and some older ponds that works really well, but the way not to apply that is to go around with a coffee can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and bet what ninety five percent of it ends up sticking in the mud on the bottom. Well, it does. It doesn't dissolve in there, or it becomes bound in mm. the bottom muds. Okay, so if you if you put it on a platform, or in the case of triple superphosphate, you don't even need a platform. You can take the bag, okay, and cut the whole top side of it out and slip it into the water that's going to be about 12 inches deep, preferably put it on a point that gets a lot of wave action, it dissolves out of that bag, you know. And so the guy calls in, he says, hey, I did what you told me to, and I cut that sack, and I put it in there. And then, well, I went back and looked at it. Well, there's stuff in the bottom. I'm not using it. I'm paying for something, and they, it's not mm-hmm. getting in the water. Right. I said, now, what you're paying for is a filler that goes into that. You're not paying for the nutrients, right. see? And so in, in his mind, he thought that he was that some of his greens weren't really dissolving in there. So then we, we went from there, and then uh, Swingle developed a technique of suspending that stuff on a platform, maybe putting that platform 12 to 18 inches deep, let the wind and wave action dissolve it. And, and that's a good way to put that out. And the fertilizer they decided on back then was like 2025, 20, okay? It's a good clover fertilizer. So you can use that in your pond. And uh, so that's one of the, when, when we got into this thing, we started looking at better ways to put this out mm. so that we didn't have to carry a 50 pound sack of fertilizer out there. And you got a 10 acre pond, you you know, you want to use a sack of that per acre in there. Well, shoot, that's a lot of weight, a lot of weight. to carry around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you get some little guy like me that doesn't like to lift all that much. <laughs> and, you know, we like to look at something else. And so we started looking into other types of fertilizers, and and we found some stuff that was <clears throat> was completely water soluble, and that you could really increase the proportions of the, the parts of the fertilizer you wanted to use, and incorporate into that water soluble stuff. And so now we've we've got something like. Uh, perfect pond plus mm-hmm. and that stuff you know you can put out five to seven pounds per acre beats the heck out of putting a 50 pound bag in right mm-hmm. so and you can pour this out because it dissolves in the upper two feet of the water column and so you can take it and do like your granddad did you could put it in a coffee can or you can just pour it out of the edge you know from the boat and just go back and forth back and forth across that pond and it dissolves in the upper two feet of the water column and then the wind moves this dissolved fertilizer all around the pond Hmm. so it's a much better way to put things out and so as don and i started looking at this and decided what else we could do to improve this well one of the things that we thought about was uh incorporating some micronutrients in there you know and they, they use this in in different types of horticulture different nutrients and micronutrients that, that have seemed to be very important in the growth of a lot of plants. So we figured, well, growth of plankton is a plant. Let's see if we can incorporate some of this in there. And so that's some of the things we did. And as we developed this fertilizer, we wanted to, we wanted to talk to people who were experts in fertilizers and see what type of ingredients we needed to combine in there that were dissolvable. And so there, there are a lot of companies that make this stuff, but we have the most dissolvable ingredients in Perfect Pond that, that there is out there. Yeah, a lot of those micros are usually unavailable. Um, and I'm not sure, in, in, you know, when you're dealing with soils, 
um, they they refer to it as chelated, right? Mm-hmm. To make them more available. I don't know if that's what's used uh, in the in the Perfect Pond Plus though, but uh, it's in an available form. It's in for, an available form. That's correct. That's correct. And the ingredients that go into that stuff are or the most dissolvable that you can get. Now they're more expensive. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's why most people don't put them in there because they want to do the cheapest thing. So, so it's an amazing product. It, yeah, it honestly, really we have so many biologic products over the years. It's, it's it really stellar. may be our very best product that we sell. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, We never get a complaint about it. No, no. it's no. a great it, product. And once a guy tries it, he won't go. Oh, away. Yeah. So no tell way. a guy how he can look at his water that's and right. tell if he that's needs to, to fertilize. What's, we, Seeky disc, is that correct? I mean, and I guess clear water is not a good thing. No, and a lot of people don't realize that because they want, well, my, my wife wants to swim here. Yeah. I said, well, get her a membership. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you got, do you want to grow big bass or do you, you want to go swimming? You can still swim in fertile water. That's, That's right. right. You can. You don't want to be able to see your toes yeah. anyway. That's, That's, right. Right. That's right. But it's got to be green. It, we want it to be green. So we, right? want it, we want it to be green. But on the other hand, you can get too green. So what what you need to do is to, is to try to check the visibility in there. You can't just go look at it. What do you think, Clyde? Is this yeah. greener than it was last time? I can see time? three foot in there. That's, well, that's right. what I always do. That's exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> Man, he sticks no. his foot in there. It's yeah. kind of like the glove glove with herbicides. Yeah, yeah but no. everybody doesn't. Everybody can't buy one of those rings, Bobby. So, I mean, I yeah. think there's, yeah. a, there's a simple way to check. Simple way to do that. One, the one simple way is to, you can, you can get a yardstick, mm-hmm. okay? That's measured in inches and millimeters if you're into that. But... Put you a piece of white plastic on the end of it, just with a tack. Stick it down in the water and see how far you can push it down until it disappears. Okay. What really you're looking for, ideally, is something that's going to be between 20 and 24 inches. The hotter it gets in the summer, the more I like to see it extended so that you don't get develop something that's going to be 14 or 15 inches. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's when you're looking for trouble in the middle of the summer when it gets hot and you get these thunderstorms coming in. And so you don't want your pond to turn over, but you, you don't want to have, an, have a deprivation of oxygen. You do it like that. If you read some of the old literature developed in the 1950s, and listen, I, I, work, for, I work for the state of Alabama, and, and that was our Bible, okay? So it said 18 to 18 inches. That's, that's too thick, Okay. So let let that thin out a little bit in the summer. It's okay to have it in the springtime. You get a good heavy bloom on it. That's good. That's when a lot of your fish are hatching out. They need all that plankton. But as you go into the summer, let it let it clear up to about 24 inches. And I like to do that before I even fertilize. Hmm. Okay. So let it clear to that depth before you begin to fertilize. If your lake is a is got uh, good alkalinity in it. And it blooms off real easy. When you get into the summer, just use a half ration and see what happens. Once it clears to 24, fertilize it again. If you think you can get by with a full level of fertilization, then uh, you can you can do that. But it's better to be safe than sorry most of the time. So, so how so, often should should we do this? You do you don't do it monthly, okay? Mm-hmm. You don't put it on a schedule where you go in every three weeks. Hey, it's time yeah. to fertilize. Put some more out. That's right. Put some more. I don't care if you just yeah. put, it, put some more. That's what the book says. Yeah. So just go in there and check your visibility and fertilize by visibility. That's the that's the proper way. So if you can it. see it 24 inches down, add some fertilizer. Add fertilizer. Right. All and, right. And when do you normally begin fertilization in the spring? At, like at a certain temperature or... Well, if you if you read the books that were published in 1952, okay, <laughs> it says uh, you start in February. Okay, that's wrong. The reason they wanted to start in February is because they had they had all kinds of algae and weed problems, and so if they could develop a bloom on there that shaded out the sunlight from the bottom, then that deterred the development of algae and other types of of uh, types of vegetation. So, but in my opinion, uh, for what that's worth, I, I like to wait till April. Hmm. And the reason is because uh, water temperature is warmed up enough 
that you get a good response to your fertilization at that period of time. So I think you're wasting a lot of the earlier applications if you start in February. You get February, March, you know. You trying to go skinny dip in that time of the year, buddy. Oh yeah, the chili. Yeah. yeah. What's the what? What about you know? We've got such a warmer spring right now than we've had. We did have a colder night for one night, but pretty much looking at seventy five degree days or so for a week straight coming up. What what water temperature do you want to see? Just approximately. I'd like to see in the mid sixties. Okay, yeah, that's so what I'm looking for. Okay. I'm, so right now your water temperatures are running in the high fifties. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, just a little bit early. That wouldn't hurt to put out now, but I just like to wait till about mid April. To start for a Who is this Clyde guy he keeps talking must about? Sounds a, like you, Clyde. Right? It might be, I'm probably kin to him. I think he must have had a bully when he was in school named Clyde or something. So, uh, so Barry, uh, help explain this, because this is one thing that kind of, when we started learning about fertilizer, some of the older ponds, Lanny, yours may fit this, yes, old. drains off the top. Yeah. And if you get a bloom going and you get a big rain, you can lose your bloom. You can. And then but some of the more modern newer ponds drain off the bottom they and do. it don't affect that as much. It does not. And and they you can do this on any established pond. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's old one like you've got, Lanny. So mm-hmm. so it was built maybe it was built in the fifties or sixties. Uh you can come in and do a siphon system in there. Okay. And and what that is is that's a pipe. You don't have to break the dam to mm-hmm. put it in. You you just go, the pipe lays right underneath the surface of the dam. Okay. okay. So you put deep enough that you can drive over it with your truck or tractor. But the but the front end of that siphon that goes down into the lake goes down toward the bottom. You just run, run that pipe straight down, down the dam until you get in some really deep water. And then... The backside of the siphon, it works just like a regular siphon does. You know, the backside needs to be a third the length of the front. And you, you're pulling off the bottom of that stuff. So when the water rises up, it goes out this automatic siphon system and sucks that water off the bottom. Hmm. That way, that's below where your plankton is. And so it sucks the bad water really off the bottom of your pond and allows that plankton to stay in the upper three or four feet of water. Nice. I got some work to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like the the best scenario for a guy it's, trying to really manage. The it's the best, you know. In the in the old days, back when we started with these uh, with these stand up pipes, you know, they had a drain valve on it. Uh, most of those that were put in back in the fifties or sixties have rotted out because they used corrugated pipe. Oh yeah. You know, they thought it would last for twenty years, and now all them guys that designed it's going to be retired by then, so it was no big deal. <laughs> but it, you know, using a PVC pipe or stamp pipe. They they started <clears throat> with a uh, a pipe that went over that upright, okay, and it was elevated uh, three or four inches or six inches above the surface of the water, and so it kept logs and stuff from mm-hmm. putting getting over your stamp pipe and stopping that. And then that sleeve that went over there, because it was above the the water level, sucked water from the bottom of that sleeve. See, so depending on how deep your sleeve was, if it was six feet, it sucked it out from six feet below the surface. And so that was a pretty good deal yeah. back in the day. But today, the way to go is a, a siphon system. It's an automatic system, works perfectly. When If the pond comes up, it siphons. When the pond goes down, there's a little air, air break on that thing. And as soon as it breaks the surface of the water, the siphon quits. Hmm. So it, it works. It works flawlessly most of the time. Mac, you got a question? <clears throat> I do. So when when I think about fertilizing, uh, I immediately go to food plots, and yeah. we preach soil test. Sure. So is there a similar process with ponds, or is or do you just kind of fertilize them the same? You, no, no, there is a similar process. And one of the things that happens here is the same thing that happens in your food food plot, okay? If you're, if the pH of your water is too acidic, that prevents your plants from taking up the fertilizer you put out in your food plot. Everybody knows that, you know? You you lime those things. Well, the same thing happens to your pond. If your pond is, has got acidic soils, especially bottom soils in there, then the way to make your fertilizer more efficient is to neutralize that acidity in the bottom of your lake. 
And, uh, and there are a couple of ways to do that, but one of the primary ones that we use is to use a lime and barge, and we use, you know, natural ground lime and put that out and cover the whole lake, the whole bottom of the lake, and that neutralizes the acidity of the bottom, and that makes your water quality more suitable to grow plankton when you apply fertilizer. I will say and interject what he says, that if you're thinking about it and you're building a pond, and there's a lot of people out there building ponds these days, save yourself a lot of time and trouble and money, do a soil test, when it's dry before you let the water in and sure. line i've seen y'all do it for people a bunch of times sure. line that thing with the lime it needs plus some before you ever put it it's so much easier and actually probably a little more accurate in maintaining yeah. it in the history of the pond you you may have to come back depending on the soil and how much decays and all in the future right. but you're way out of the game to do it before it fills up with water that's exactly what we did with your uncle's pond when mm -hmm. we re renovated that and as that pond was dry we were adding structure and stuff to it i said look take your equipment and and build you a road inside the pond that you can drive a lime truck over and get that all the way around the edge of the pond and make sure you can cover the whole thing. Well, they, they just got some bulk lime delivered just like they would put in there. In their <laughs> they're not box. they're not five miles from the lime plant, so that, that worked <laughs> yeah, out good not. for them. Yeah, and so that really works out well. So you can add that, and you, and you cannot add too much. Mm -hmm. So if, if your soil sample comes back, like most of them do that I've ever sent in, and said, yeah, Mr. Smith, yeah, you you your plot here, you need a ton to the acre or two tons. Just go ahead and put five tons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're better off. Okay. You're right. better well, off. There's so much stuff's going to decay in that pond. Yeah. I mean, especially I think if you have a lake surrounded by trees and oh, all those leaves exactly and stuff in there, which you have, you're going to, it's going to, right. it's going to happen a lot faster. You're way ahead of the game to lime that thing to death. Exactly. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. Hey guys, Dudley from Gamekeepers here. I want to tell you about the all new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed for everywhere. Nosler is known for their bullets and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate, and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. What's the cutting edge technology in farm pond and in, in, in pond management for sport fish, growing big bass? What's the latest? Well, the latest thing is it is a, a little different from what you read in ni in the booklet published in 1952. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine okay. that. Yeah. Okay. That they probably hadn't updated yet. Yeah, no, I mean, it's still the same as it was, but they just reprint. But the <laughs> the things things have changed a little bit. Okay, things have changed since when you went fishing with your granddaddy. Okay, or your dad. All right, back in those days, we were looking to catch whatever we would catch that were big enough to eat and mm -hmm. take those home and clean them and cook them. Okay, well, mm -hmm. uh, today things have changed, not just from that standpoint, but, you know, uh, my first wife would, wouldn't let me cook fish in the house. Of course, she's not around him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> so so what, what, what's different is that back in those days, it wasn't the objective to catch big bass. Okay, the objective was to provide food for these poor farmers mm -hmm. who had a, a pond out there that they used to water their cattle with or, or just had a site that they built in there. They, they weren't after big fish. They were after trying to trying to provide more protein for that family as a way of sustenance okay so now since nobody very few people get to cook fish in the house uh 
what they're looking for is, uh, is something big enough to have fun catching and throwing back if they can. Catch and, and release. Uh, it's catch and release. So that's the big that's the big thing. So now what we've got is we're looking at ways to improve the food supply for these bass so that they grow faster and they grow larger. Okay. So back in the day, I can remember when you went to somebody's pond and, and one or two things, either either all the bass were like 10 or 12 inches or everybody had caught all the bass out. Mm-hmm. And so there were hardly any bass in there. So now the thing is to try to keep that food supply coming and keep those bass growing at a very rapid rate. So we've looked at new things since 1952, Okay. We still like bluegill and bass because, as Toxie mentioned earlier, they they spawn every month during the summer, and and that's the best fish to put in to provide constant food for your bass population. But there's some new things that we've discovered back in in the last 20 years, and and that's threadfin shad. You look at any lake that produces big bass on a consistent basis, and I would say 90 percent of them have threadfin in there. Okay, threadfin are a filter feeder. Uh, they feed off of the plankton population that's in your lake. If you if you fertilize your lake, it's ideal for threadfin. If your lake is really clear that you letting your wife swim in, because you can see down to eight or ten feet, threadfin are not going to do well there because there's not enough food in there to keep that population going and keep them reproducing. So that's the that's one of the keys to that, and the other keys are. The fact that we've looked at beyond food, we've looked at just the same thing that we've done in a lot of other species, and that's look at genetics. Genetics is very important, but the limiting factor in all production is food supply. Food supply first, genetics second. So that's 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 how we've improved these things, and and we've we manage these things now the way they wouldn't want you to manage back in the 50s and 60s. And that is we manage it so that the the whole bluegill population, the whole lake population is almost crowded bluegill. Hmm. We want lots and lots of bluegill in there. We don't necessarily want them to grow real big. You know, we, we're not looking for one pound bluegill in lakes that we're planning on producing big bass. In. We want lots of little three to four inch bluegill. So, so that's most of these bass can eat. Is is there any excuse me? Is there anything you can plant in a pond that is beneficial for the fishery? There are some things that you can plant, okay, uh, that but they don't really benefit the fishery all that much. Okay, for instance, if if you were if you wanted to improve your shellcracker fishing, like we talked about before, there could be some aquatic macrophytes you could plant in there but the problem is trying to control those things so that they don't suck all the fertility out of your lake and and which which they're known to do uh that would improve the food supply for your shellcracker but not necessarily for your bluegill and there are other things that you can put in there that uh that might be good uh cover for small fish there's things that you can water water willow, not common willows. American but, water willow. That's right, exactly. Very good. And uh, those things will provide some some cover for the young of the year fish to get in. And that's beneficial in a way. But we we're typically uh, non plant people, so so well, you got to have cover though. I mean, you got to have cover. But you can put that in yourself with something that doesn't grow. So I'm going to name four things real quick, and you just tell me what you think about them as a forage. Uh, fathead minnows. Fathead minnows are excellent forage for the first year. They're, so, they're too slow. It's the only problem. Okay. They wipe them out. So what happens typically is just like your uncle's like that we just stock fatheads in today. I said, guys, you got you got a lot of structure in here. you got some logs in here. Fathead minnows are different from a lot of other species because they – they spawn upside down. Hmm. Okay, people don't realize that, but they get on the underneath side of rocks and logs, and they have an adhesive egg, and they deposit that up under there. I said, when when the end of April gets here, you go to your market, get you a couple of these uh, waxed meat cartons that they put chicken and steaks in, 
bring those back, cut them apart, lay them flat, put them in your lake. They'll float till the end of the summer. If you want to know if your fat and minnows are spawning, go lift one of those boxes up that's floating, and you'll see the eggs on under, the underneath side of them. Now, this is not necessarily for production of the fat heads because you've got plenty of structure in here for them to get up underneath, but, you know, it'd be hard for you to see that. But this will let you know that your fat heads are spawning. But I said, I'll tell you this, in most situations, by the end of October... All your fat heads are gone. Well, what happened to them? Bass ate every one of them. Hmm. That's exactly what, and it increases your bass growth the first year. If you've got an established bass population and you're adding fat head minnows, you're just wasting your money. They're just eating them as soon as you throw them as soon out. As you they're, put too, them in. they're too slow. Yeah. They're just a. They're slow and, and they're small and they don't spawn all that much. And the, the other part is that they, they're just. Uh, you know, most people don't realize how many pounds of fish it takes to produce a pound of bass. Okay, I do because I, I ran. Mm-hmm. Don and I ran a hatchery. You know, we we had a thousand pounds of broodfish. Okay, males and females and northerns and yes, floras. Okay, so we had to we had to feed those things all year to keep them in good enough shape. So when the spring came, that they had produced a lot of eggs and were good producers. It takes at least eight pounds of bluegill to produce one pound of bass. Hmm. So that's if you, yeah, that's a lot of little bluegill. It's that's a lot right. of little bluegill. So if, if you feed it, whatever you feed them, if you were to feed them shiners or whatever, so you pay five dollars a pound for shiners. That's a bargain. Okay. Mm-hmm. Multiply that times eight. Yeah. You got forty dollars in a bass yeah, that weighs bass. one pound. Hmm. What do you think you can sell that for? <laughs> yeah. Not quite 40. Mm-mm. Maybe volume makes more money. I'm not sure. I, I'm not a good businessman. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I may not be like everybody else, but I'm not, you know, the bass thing is not really my thing. One, that it's not my favorite fish to eat. I, I prefer brim and crappie and right. stuff like that. So are there any tips? <laughs> like, I mean, I, I'd rather be hunting than catching a bass and throwing it back. That's oh, just good. But um, blasphemy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So, up, what are some things you can do to improve your panfish? There are two things on, there. at your pond. Right. There are two at things your, you can do. Okay. Most important thing is to fertilize. Okay. The second most important thing in panfish is a feeder. Okay. Okay. Use a good quality feed. Don't go buy this adult catfish stuff to put out there with 30, 28%, 30% protein. They make some good feed out there now that has a higher protein content. The bluegill like it, and they grow very fast on it. So if I had a pond, I want to bring some big bluegill in, that'd be one, that would be one of the things, one of the two things that I would recommend. So let's pretend like Dudley didn't ask that question. And move, and move. So I've asked you about f- fat heads. What yeah. about crawfish? Stocking crawfish in a pond in a bass pond. Well, as you know, bass love crawfish, and you can buy this stuff by the sack. You know, you can put hundreds of pounds in there. But if you take a crawfish out and you and you take a bluegill and you hold them side by side in your hands, okay. The crawfish has about 60 to 80 percent chitin. Okay, that's an indigestible material that the bass gets nothing from when he eats that crawfish. Okay. Compared to a bluegill, which is a nice, uh, which is a nice succulent little meal for mm-hmm. a bass. Mm-hmm. So I think I think you're better off to take the money that you would have used for crawfish. And turn around and buy intermediate bluegill and put it in your pond if you're okay. need food. What about tilapia? I hear a lot of people. Tilapia works well. That's uh, those things spawn quite often. And the uh, the one added thing about tilapia is that uh, that during the during the summer and the time that they're spawning, that the females are actually uh, keep the fry inside their mouth. Hmm. Wow. So the they're, they suck water in to feed the fry, but they keep those fry inside there so that they're not consumed by something like green sunfish or 
a really big bluegill or something else that could eat those, you know, and and they're not available to small bass typically because they're guarded by that tilapia female. And uh, and then in the in the fall when the temperatures start dropping, these tilapia become slower than fathead menace. Uh. And so the bass are able to come in and uh, fish this probably four inches in size or maybe five or three to five and catch those things really rapidly. And then they're able to put on a lot of weight. So that's one of the advantages of of having tilapia in your pond. Some states don't allow tilapia, so you need to check your regulations to make sure that it's illegal to put those in. But it's just like all of us that are sitting here, okay? If, if you want to lose weight, don't eat you a bunch of hamburgers and go sit on the couch. Okay? <laughs> Same thing applies to your fish. You know, you want to be, you want the fish, the bass, the predator to be as efficient as it can be in consuming a bait. Don't just put one bluegill or one tilapia out there for him to chase all around the lake hmm. to try to eat. Get a bunch of them and make sure he can uh, capture those without without expending too much energy. Okay. That makes sense. It, yeah. It seems to have been, we've tried most of that. It seems, you know, without going back and, and, and shocking and actually physically surveying, it just seems like the threadfin shed have worked the best. And we actually see survival over time with the right cover more than other stuff. You know, I mean, the, the brim is the king. But as far as incremental of that, it seems like, the, to me at least, we've had the best luck with the three-pin shad. Absolutely. I agree with that completely. And and if you put tilapia in there, they're going to win or kill. So you have to stock them again the following oh, year. Okay. Yeah. If you stock shad in there, in most climates, they're going to last for at least five years before you have a, before your pond ices over to the point that these things will die. Hmm. So you make a good point. I remember having a – we had a – a guest one time that talked about managing some ponds and they had no structure in them and those bass would like just swim loops and, uh-huh. and just cruise and, all the time and exercise it. yeah but yeah. once they put structure out in the lake and then they just parked by that structure they were able to start putting some weight on them that's true and they're just sitting there waiting for something that they can eat to come by yeah, yeah. rather than cruising the whole lake so, you know, structure is very important. Well, the other thing is you can't, your bait fish can't survive if there's no structure. They're going to wipe right. it out They're and then there's famine and sets, you know, yeah. famine sets in in the yeah. kingdom. So how, so help our listeners understand. So, so some guys in Minnesota listening to this, they really don't need to be worried about fertilizing their pond. And can, where does that line kind of break? It seems like it's a southeastern thing, Texas over. It's pretty much it's pretty much southeastern and east Texas. There are some places in Texas where fertilization is not effective. Okay, where where they've got enough hardness in there and, and enough uh, they grow enough plankton naturally in there that they don't need to need to do that. You know, so you guys up there in Minnesota. That typically is not an area that you would consider fertilizing your pond, and then they they can grow some pretty pretty good fish in in those areas because they have a lot of natural nutrients there in those lakes. Remember, Bobby and I worked a trade show one time with a, a it was there was extension agents from all over the country, and right. we had set up our booth and had our fish pond fertilizer sitting out, and like the ones that weren't in the southeast, they saw this pond fertilizer and they were like what are you doing you know, they, they didn't even know about, about that's right it. yeah they, they're not aware of that and then the other the other part there's another segment out there and a lot of these people are are in the midwest and north area in there where, where they don't want to add any nutrients to the yeah they don't want to add like phosphates to that's the, right but that would be like more in a river system not a closed system that's that's a, yeah. a pond yeah so anyway they're in 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 a lot of our worlds here, it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly advantageous to fertilize and if you've got your water quality right, just like liming. Um, what is, is that pH supposed to be seven or? The pH varies. See, a lot of people look at that as an indicator of whether they need to lime or not, mm-hmm. but actually that pH fluctuates during the day as a diurnal fluctuation. Ah. So you start out in the morning, your your pH is a, a little lower, and then as you develop through the day, if you've got any plankton in there at all, the pH rises. 
So if somebody says, oh, well, this is my pond and this is the pH, what do you think? I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> what time of day did you take this sample? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big part of what's wow. going on there. So total alkalinity is what we like to look at. Gotcha. And if that's low, typically, you know, this, this is an arbitrary threshold, but we usually use 20 parts per million. Okay. If it's below 20, it can benefit from lime in your lake. If it's above that, you don't need to worry about it. It's so just like just 20, like your, your uncle's point. lake down there, Toxie. Yeah. Uh, I took water samples on that, and there's 40 parts per million because they've got they've got some lime in that area down there, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and they don't need any lime in in that pond, although they did add some to it. So I remember it's a long time ago when and you had you were, you were stocking one and you had the it's, a, it's a, like a big test tube with a dropper. Yeah, that's right. And he was dropping and dropping. And I was like, what, what, what do we got here? What's it, what's it going to be like? And he was dropping <laughs> and he was dropping and he kept looking at it and dropping. And then finally he just threw the whole thing of water out. He said, don't worry about it. You're not going to have a problem. <laughs> that's right. So evidently it was really high. It was really high. And I, I recall that, but a lot of times in a lot of the lakes that we look at, you know, you, we take that same test tube full of water. We put some, chemicals in there so that when we can we titrate that with, with an acid and a lot of times you'll add one drop or two bingo it turns color mm -hmm. and that indicates that your alkalinity is probably five to ten really low and so you, that really benefits from adding some lime to that I guarantee you I'm going to have to put some lime in that. Oh, you lime. know. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, alkalinity versus pH is, man, yeah. it's, it's hard to it's figure hard out to in the brain. Yeah. That's no. right. That's but right. it's 20 parts per million is the alkalinity. threshold you're looking at. That's right, alkalinity. And, and, you know, you and the opposite part of that is, you know, we look at some lakes that are that may be over some coastal lakes, for instance, and you take the pH of that, yeah, well, my bluegill ain't spawning. I said, well, what, you know, what kind of water quality you got? I don't know. It looks pretty good to me. <laughs> but, you know, that you sounds like a hundred percent because it does look pretty good to me. All right. So, so you run the pH on that and it ends up being four. <laughs> well, you're not going to get much plankton production. Mm -hmm. And then you've got some other things that are affected by, by a low pH like that. For instance, bluegill reproduction and, mm -hmm. and bass reproduction. So, you know, so you so you you test your pH and your alkalinity, alkalinity, but the pH is not the it's not the key factor. Could I just take like a pool test strip? You can sticker in there. You all can. Right. You can. All right. You got that's, one of those. I got some of those. Hey, that's close enough for government work. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, I know uh, <laughs> alkalinity is important when you're growing crops, like at our nursery. Oh right. yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. We uh, we like to stay below a hundred. Yeah. So yeah. quickly, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your thoughts on northern black bass and Florida bass? What you would recommend stocking, or a hybrid of those, or what? What, what are your? What do you love to see? Well, northern bass were were native to most of Mississippi and Alabama. There was some influence down in South Alabama with a, with some Florida genetics that came up, you know, out of North Florida and <clears throat> that area there, but. But there have been a lot of studies done on these. I mean, recently. Uh, when I say recently, I mean in the last 20 years. Okay, And so one of the things that, that was discovered was that the, uh, the northern bass are much more aggressive than Florida bass. And so far, they're much easier to catch. Hmm. So one of the things that uh, we did at the hatchery was to develop a fish that was a cross between a fast-growing Florida fish, and a fast-growing northern, okay? And the reason we got on to this thing, because when we first started, we grew all Floridas because we wanted our clients to grow some big fish, you know, and have, have maybe a 10 or 12 or 14-pounder or bigger in there. Well, Clyde wanted a big fish. Yeah, yeah. Clyde, right. wanted so Clyde wanted that. So, uh, so we get a call, you know, one time down in South Alabama, and they said, look, I think we need to restock this lake with some bass. <laughs> I said, well, what's the problem, Clyde? He said, well, we can't catch any of them. I said, well, are you sure they're not in there? Well, look, me and Leroy, we can't. We're as good as there is, okay? We ain't caught nothing. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll tell you what to do. Let's, let's just let us bring our shocking boat down there, okay? 
and uh, we'll put it in and see what you've got. Maybe you don't have any bass. I don't know. I've never fished there. So we bring the shocking boat down and put it in. Well, they got, they got everybody's a member was there. You know? <laughs> and so they're all huddled around the bank and in the boats out there. I said, look, just don't get in the electrodes, you know. Try not to pick up anything that's in front of the boat. Yeah, they, they won't do it but once. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so anyway, we get out there and start shocking. Well, we hadn't shocked five minutes. We turned the water white with fish that were about 7 to 10 and 11 pounds. They ain't as good as they thought they were. <laughs> no, they weren't. And so it ended up, as we looked at the records for this thing, this was stocked a number of years ago by the state at that particular time. All they stocked was Florida bass. Hmm. So they were all Florida bass. And so Don and I went back home. We said, look, we, uh, we, just, we can't develop this kind of fishery for these people. We need to do something that's different. So we got to talking about it for a little bit, and I said, you know, back in the day, you know, I, you started with state, and I did too. We started a little program where we did Floras and Northerns, and, and we combined those two and had a hybrid between the two. And we looked at the growth on these things and, and uh, discovered that the hybrid actually was a faster-growing fish than either of the parents were. Hmm. So we started developing a program where where we were selecting what kind of brood fish we had and making these hybrids. And originally we called them F ones. You know, well, everybody had F one. So we we had a, we had a lake that we had stocked from the origin, and we had a bunch of people from Bass over that we let them fish in there, and uh, and we had Tom Mann come up. He said, "Man, these things, these things are these are the toughest fish I've I've caught bass." He said, "You don't need to call these F ones. These are like tigers." Hmm. So Tom contributed to the fact that we call these fish tiger bass. Tiger bass. Yeah, that's how they got his name. wasn't well, because, wasn't because I was clever enough to think of it or Don <laughs> either. Bless our hearts, but you know. Heterosis, hybrid That's, vigor. There you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So was 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 it a boy northern and a female Florida or it the was, opposite? It was okay. that hmm. a boy northern and a female Florida. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And you found something different if you flip that. Probably, uh, we didn't do much of that flipping because uh, it worked. Was, but so what we did worked, and that was uh, we thought that was the best. We thought that would be the best thing to. To have that good growth potential in it, and uh, so they're they're still producing those at, at uh, American Sport Fish now. So on an average, how if a guy stocks the right fish, has the right feeder fish program, follows what you recommend, yeah. what kind of weight can he put on a bass every? What can he expect a two pound two year old fish to weigh? Four pounds. Hmm. Well, we've, we've seen these tiger bass grow from two inches to two pounds. Six months. Wow. Yep. October. So when the lake at our place down there, we all fished yeah. the Smuggler Lake. Yeah, it's awesome. And we, we did it the first time. The Actually, the cormorants destroyed it. We started over. And he we did his formula. And I, for a fact, I mean, you stocked them in June. Right. And so they were actually would be, you know, a year old maybe in April. Or May, May, that's right. Yeah. That's so, right. but you stocked him in June. So anyway, I remember uh, on a, one of Neil's friends caught, and we waited. It was just a ounce under nine pounds, and that fish was not quite three years old. Wow! And I saw it from my eyes, and there's no other fish could have been in there. We drained right. and started over. So that's what could. I know that's probably a little extraordinary, but I know you've seen that before too. I have. It can happen. And the main thing I just tell everybody I said. Get, I mean, look, use him. If not, get, there are some great people, you know, but go by what they tell you. Use that formula, like we've talked most of it today, and you can do that everywhere. You can. And it's, it's amazing at how rapidly these things can, can grow. So, like I said, food supply is critical. So, you've got to develop that to begin with, and that all goes back to your original stocking, okay? The way you stock it and what proportion of bluegill to bass you put in. To give you an example, in 1950, you know, they stocked 1,000 bluegill and 100 bass. 
And so that's kind of been a standard for a number of years. Well, <clears throat> just uh, that typically gets you into, with not much harvest, gets you into a crowded bass situation where your bass quit growing after about two years. The growth slows down. But uh, if you stock it another way, the way we do, the way we did toxies, then your bass bass growth increases each year. And it's not uncommon. It's, it's a pretty common thing to to get experience two years, two pounds per year growth out of these bass. Lanny, I'm thinking in about three years, I want to come over there. <laughs> I don't I know if I'm going to let you, you in there. He just got, we just, our biggest farm we own, we completely, what happened to us was the, the, the nutria destroyed mm. that day. The levy Destroyed it. Swiss cheesed 500 yards of levy. Wow. Just destroyed it. And there was no answer, but, you know, and these are the dirt guys, but they know Greg Briggs and company. They know what they're doing. It's like yeah. you have, boss, you have no option but to start completely over. So they they drained it, let it completely dry up, dug it all the way out below there. And, I, you know, the one thing that I talked about, the, uh, the oxbow type lake, there's a guy down scuba who's just brilliant. David Bryan's built most of our stuff, all of our stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And he put, and I'd forgotten about it until Greg reminded me, he put bull panel all the way across the dam, just maybe you can put like six inches of dirt over, but he put it all the way across the dam of the one Doxbow Lake that was near the river. Because he said, but look, you're going to have, they're going to get eaten alive right. by a beaver. It'll stop them. Watch. We've never had a problem with beavers or nutrients there. I did not do it on the other one, wasn't thinking, didn't know. But this time we did, we had a bunch of, we had a bunch of hog wire stuff too left over from something. And so we put wire all the way across. I think it'll stop them, but it's amazing. I had to start completely over. Point in saying that, Bobby, is he just got through putting his finishing touches on it uh, last summer. And so you won't even have to wait three years. You could probably do it this summer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Catch up two and threes this summer. So I've got to, I'm, everybody's probably got some more questions, but I want to. There's two things I want to make sure we we touch on. How bad of a problem are otters? I, I seem like I've heard you whisper in my ear that if you're trying to grow a big bass, you need to make sure you're careful about those otters. Otters are really, really top of the line predators. Okay, usually they they work together in a group. Okay, so they'll they'll come into a lake. And they'll they'll herd these fish up just like a just like shepherd dogs on cattle, and they'll push them all up into an area, a pocket or some place in there where they can catch these things. And believe me, because uh, I, I had them at the hatchery there when we ran that thing, they'll they'll catch and kill the biggest bass you've got in there. Hmm. They're they're really they're, there's been some data generated on these things that that these things could eat if it was available to them, you know, more than 10 pounds of fish a day. So you get your six or eight otters in there that just came in from the river. They think they're in downtown at the smorgasbord. Mm, yeah. And they're going to stay there until the fishing gets bad for them. That's a lot of pounds per day. It is. It oh. is. Now, that's under ideal conditions, but still, that's the potential these things have. So guys need to be aware of that and Just watch for the runs and stuff. And watch, watch in the wintertime for runs on the backside of your dam and for, and for scat. You know, you see some little piles of droppings there that all have scales in them. The bigger the scales, the bigger the fish. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Barry, could you give us an idea of, you know, traditional stocking rates for bass versus brim on a pond? Yeah, back in the day when, when they were developing this for primarily for protein, okay, a source of protein for farmers who had a, who had a pond on their place to supplement what they could get off of their farm, then that rate was about 1,000 bluegill fingerlings followed by 100 bass fingerlings. So the bluegill were stocked in in the winter and the bass were stocked in and that's per acre. Energy. That's per acre. Gotcha. Right. Nowadays, if we want to develop specialty fisheries, for instance, you've got a lake and you want you, that you want stocked, and you want to develop a bass fishery in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll go and raise the rate of the bluegill by ten times. Uh huh. We want to change that stocking ratio from a ten to one to much increased so we might come in and stock in uh 2000 or even 5000 bluegill per acre hmm. 
and then follow that by, depending on how fertile your lake is going to be, by the maximum would be 100, but most of the time it would be 50 to 75 bass per acre. Hmm. And so that creates big, big food supply and has these bass growing off at a really, really fast rate. Rapid growth. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. I can't remember. Did you put any thread, I mean, thread fin shad? I know we always do fat heads with the brim. We did fat mm-hmm. heads with the brim, and then we followed that up with right. some thread fin shad. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mac, you, you had a question about something you've heard about all your life in Columbus. What was that? Yeah, so the, there's a creek, Mr. Berry, called the Luxapalala, and I've always heard that there's walla in there, but I never hear about anybody catching walla. Do you have any experience with that? Well, we do, because in, in Alabama, for instance, we've got walla that are native to the Coosa River system. They go all the way, all the way up and into Georgia, yeah, all the way down to Mobile. And so it's it's not unheard of to see and and run into a few people who are walleye fishermen. For instance, right there in Montgomery, Bobby, where you grew up, uh, the Tallapoosa had good walleye fishing in it. I mean, I, I caught one out of there that weighed eight pounds, eight and, eight and a half pounds. <clears throat> Did you, did Heat you, that skillet up. Yes, sir. I know. No, I, I turned him loose because I caught him in a gill net. Oh, no. <laughs> Oops. Oops. In spite of what Bobby says, I'm not that great a fisherman. Uh, anyway, but also uh, I saw uh, Danny Foster catch one that was eight pounds out of the Tallapoosa River. We were up there fishing for stripers, and he wow. caught a big walleye. And so it wasn't unusual to have somebody who fished during the time of the year of typically February, you know, late January, February, depending on the weather was to, and on through the late spring to catch walleye in the Tallapoosa with a crawfish colored crankbait. Hmm. I mean, people with some of those deep holes and I've caught a few myself, but none, none eight pounds. Yeah. But it's, it's not unusual to catch a two to three pounder or maybe a four pounder in there. And, and these are distributed all the way down the river systems to Mobile, but Nobody knows how to fish for them, you know, and so you seldom ever ever have any caught. And the same thing, we we started putting walleye in some of our state-owned and managed public fishing lakes, and these were anywhere from 25 or 30 acres to 100 and something acres in size, and we stocked enough in there we could follow them with, with our sampling techniques to know that they were growing and doing well. Hardly anybody ever caught one. So basically, we looked at it from the standpoint of managing that lake that it was a waste of time and energy and money to put those in there because nobody nobody knew how to catch them. Yeah, but you, put you, some walleye. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, they're good to eat. Though. Yeah, I like, yeah. They're as good as there is. I mean, no doubt. I'd let you teach me how to catch them if, <laughs> yeah. I, if I could grow them. <laughs> Barry, so when we, you're sitting here, you know so much, and every time you say something, I jot down another yeah, question I want to ask. But But – can you – I want to make sure we cover the big things. We – I see now, you know, our friend Jeff Foxworthy has got these really neat bubbling look things that, that, that are bubbling up in his right. lake. Old Waverly, they've got some out there. Right. It, can you talk about stratifying the water and what you're, what's going on and why you need these kind of things? Yeah, those little bubbler things are called bottom diffusers, okay? And they, they operate because they have something that's – we placed on the bottom that you can take compressed air from just a just a regular compressor, a one horse compressor, and through tubing run through this little diffuser that sits on the bottom of that thing. And as these bubbles come up to the top, a couple of things happen. Okay, one is that if if it's not already saturated with oxygen, it can add atmospheric oxygen to the water. Okay, which would increase the amount of oxygen you have in that water column. The other thing is that as these bubbles float to the surface, with them, they drag the water from the bottom up to the top. Hmm. So that bubble curtain does two things. It, it moves that water and keeps it from stratifying. And stratification means that it just layers, okay? Any of you guys remember learning how to swim in a foreign pond? You know, mm-hmm. you stripped off and... It gets uh, cold down there. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, that's right. We, yeah, we loved it. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. You, you you go out in there and, and suddenly you feel that cold water on, the, on on your lower leg or your foot. And so that's... You have just 
penetrated the thermocline or where that pond stratifies. And that bottom layer in there that's cold over a period of time uh, loses all of its oxygen. So you've got a pond out there that may be 10 or 12 feet deep, and if you've got any color on that pond during the summer, it, it, it actually shades out the bottom, and all of your oxygen level is at the top from above the thermocline. Well, this bubbler keeps that, keeps that water turning. So if you look at it like this, suppose you got a two or three story apartment and you got a bunch of people that have moved in there to live, okay? In the summertime, a pond like that that stratifies is just like moving everybody to the upper floor. So all your fish are crowded up there. So if you, if you fish, I'm down here fishing this deep hole. <laughs> Well, he just wa- tired again. He is wasting your time. You <laughs> Sounds know, like because, Carl from Sling Blade. <laughs> because there's no, there's no, there are no fish down there. There's no oxygen for them to. Be. So when you destratify that thing and keep the water moving in there, it allows both your food. This includes your insects and things to live on the bottom all the way to the top, and this spreads your fish out so they're not crowded either. So you get more food production and. All your fish are healthier if you keep that water rolling in there and keep it turning so that it does not stratify. Isn't that a great insurance policy to keep it from flipping to? It is. It's a good insurance policy to keep it from flipping. But now uh, let me give you a little warning here, and I've seen this happen a lot of times. Yeah, old Clyde, he was going to destratify his own pond. So, <laughs> yeah, me and old Leroy will put this thing in here in July the 4th. Okay, well, the pond was already stratified. So what they did is they just mixed up all that dead water from the bottom with what was up top. They flipped it for themselves. They flipped it for themselves, oh, and they killed all, kill all their fish in there. Don't want to so do that. Don't do that. So if you're going to start with these things, you need to start in the spring, okay, and then gradually start. Don't just turn it on full force. Just gradually start moving that water around and let everything He's trying to find equalized. And so yeah. I guess when we ride by the catfish ponds and see them running those big paddles, they're doing the same thing, but even at a higher volume of movement. I yeah, guess. very similar. But a lot, a lot of those ponds can destratify, but typically they're shallow enough that they're just adding oxygen to that. So to keep those things, the catfish from dying from oxygen deprivation. Yeah. So Go ahead, Mac. All right, Mr. Berry, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. So when we we're talking about the size of a pond, in acres right but we're not talking about the depth of the pond so i mean you could have a five acre pond that's two feet deep yeah or a two acre pond that's 20 feet deep right so the water is obviously a lot greater in the deeper of the pond so would that cause you to have to use more fertilizer based on the 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 deepest parts of your pond because like your, your authorized size of your ponds way bigger the deeper it is. That's true, but most of your fertile most of your fertility is in the upper layer of that water because it's only it only goes down as deep as you get sunlight penetration. Okay, so that that helps produce your plankton, which helps produce your food supply. So if that if the if the pond that's 20 feet deep is stratified, you got nothing on the bottom in there growing. I mean, there's no oxygen down there. So you don't have any plankton, you don't have any insects, except anaerobic stuff and, and no other food or fish down there. So just as a kind of a happy medium, we, we base our fertility on surface acres and on the visibility that we get off of that. So if if you got if you got a good bloom in there and your visibility is twenty to twenty four inches, you're good to go. So let me let me kind of circle back here. This is one of the things I wanted to ask you. Many, many years ago you helped us get our magazine Farming for Wildlife started that morphed into Gamekeepers. Right. In the early days you wrote several articles about Pond, all female bass ponds that you right. were experimenting with, and it just it sounded r- really exciting. There's actually the Mossy Oak Golf Course. We stocked it. You guys stocked it that way, it, and they've right. caught some big fish. What's the latest in that? Is, is that? Would you say that's been a success, or were there challenges with that that y'all didn't anticipate? 
Well, there's some challenges with that. I mean, for instance, uh, one of the first lakes that we stocked with all females that was of any size was about a 25-acre lake, and it was owned by a doctor, okay, in Montgomery. And uh, it's not to say anything derogatory about doctors and fishing, but, you know, he called in about, I mean, we talked to him every year. We went out and sampled the fish. You know, every spring we sampled them with electrofishing and recorded our data and, and could see that these things were growing and everything was looking good out there. But he called in and said, look, I, uh, I don't really like this thing. I said, well, why not? Uh, you know, you, you, you were there. You saw the fish that we got out there when we, when we sampled it. He said, yeah, but, you know, I can't catch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And I said, well, um, these are all, these are, these are F1s. You shouldn't be able to catch them. I don't understand. Well, I don't think there's enough of them in here. I said, I'll tell you what, let me, uh, let's go back and, and take a look at that and see. So this was one of the drawbacks to having this all female lake is that, is that we were looking for developing really fast growing fish in some large trophy bass, which we did in that particular lake. And the problem was uh, that he was not a really good fisherman. You know, he was kind of like Bobby. <laughs> mm -hmm. so he, Thank you for saying that. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. so anyway, he was he, he was trying to go out and you know and and flip a plastic worm up on the bank and pull it off and whatever and, and and so his kids fished out there and they they weren't any better than he was of course because he's the one that taught them how to fish and so they couldn't catch they couldn't catch very many of them and so that was disappointing and so we had to kind of work this thing a little bit where we maybe increase the stocking rate a little bit from what we stocked to his was like 30 or 35 per acre and, uh, and since these were females, they were already adults, and we had let this like go a year building up forage before we put any bass in there. So the, so the, the growth rate was really exceptional in there. And uh, so we, we came back every year and added a few, but what we really needed to do was maybe tailor this to the individual because everybody's not a trophy bass fisherman. Now, I took a buddy of mine over there who's a really good fisherman. He was a tournament fisherman, and he was a trophy bass fisherman. And so, uh, he, man, he thought he had died and gone to heaven. Uh, he and I fished together for like four hours, and we caught 25 bass that were over six pounds. And, you know, he thought he had died and gone to heaven. That was really good. But these guys were disappointed because we caught more fish than they had caught in the whole year. I think it's probably safe to say that that is a, a, still a strategy, but for the guy who wants to grow the single biggest fish, Maybe not to go catch a lot all the time necessarily. Right. Y'all were able to do it, but you probably the first of those techniques that fish had seen when y'all went there too. So, you know, um, I can see where it would be a drawback to the average recreational fisherman That's that right. loves to catch them. And look, you can still grow really big fish. But, you know, if a guy like wants to, you know, ensure he catches a 15 pounder or some crazy number, he's looking for the single biggest fish he can grow. That's probably the best way to do it. That's the best way to do it for several reasons. And, and it can actually be an advantage to some guy who's just likes to catch decent-sized fish. Okay, the big advantage to this is that all females have the potential to be trophies. Males typically top out at about four pounds. You'll see, I've seen some, but I've seen lots and lots of bass. I've seen some that are six and a half pounds that were males. That's the exception. So most of these things will top out at probably three to four pounds as a male. Hmm. But so to grow that three to four pound fish, he's just as much food, you know, to begin with as does a female. The other advantage of this is that, that you have, if you've got an all female lake, you have no reproduction. There's no obligation for you to continue to take fish out 20 pounds per acre or something out of your lake in order to keep the best that are in there growing very rapidly. So that's the big advantage is you don't have to harvest. You can just catch them and throw them back if you want to. And then and, and everything's fine. But you you go into another type of lake, you know, like Dudley's and you know, and you may be required, you may need to take some bass out. So then that puts a little extra pressure on you. 
you know, well, uh, and typically what we see is, well, we didn't catch but about four or five. Let's just turn them loose, you know, and then and then you keep building up all these all these small bass, and then the next thing you know, you you really have run out of food. It's it's kind of like a you know you can only have so many cattle on the pasture. Well, you're you're probably more likely to catch the same fish again or catch a or fish to a fish present a lure to a fish that's been caught before and all that because you know you've got less if you fish yeah. it. Seems like you'd probably be conscious not to fish it too hard, which actually leads me to a question I was thinking about, Bobby, that I think a lot of people, I'd love to know, just a general opinion. I know it's not perfect science, but we've talked to Kevin Van Dam and Hank Parker and Bill Dance and you know some of our Mossy Oak fishing sure. people about you know fishing pressure and when you catch a fish, how is it effective, how long would you wait for you catch that fish again? Or like if you had a bunch of people coming to fish for a weekend, did you need to leave it alone for a while? Or did it even matter? What's your opinion on the fishing pressure and um, how it affects fishing? I think it matters, okay? And I, I've seen this in a number of situations. So if you go out and you put a lot of pressure on these fish and you catch some and you throw them all back, you know, that, that some of those fish will, will hit again right away. But after a while, some of them get to where they don't want to hit and they don't want to feed because they, they've just learned that that's not the thing to do. So fishing pressure can be handled in, in a number of different ways. But if you, if you harvest the proper size out of there, that helps a little bit. Okay. But then if you, if you, some of these lakes that we've managed actually had, had uh, clients that wanted us to come in and harvest them with electric fishing. So that we could take out the numbers that needed to take out without making them look, look yeah, bullshit. without without you know, without stretching their lips too much, so they didn't, <laughs> want, they didn't want to buy it again. But yeah, that's that's a that's a real it's it's a real problem, and for for these legs, they have a lot of pressure in them. That, so I need to keep Bobby out of there more. Is what you're saying, well, well, Barry? You're not helping me out. <laughs> First, you hurt me a minute ago. Now you hurt me again. I so. knew. I knew, I knew we need to put a collar on him. So, look, we've been at this a while. We could, yeah. I think we could sit here and, and we need to do this again. You've, mm -hmm. you've been very uh, educational. I've learned a lot. I try to write down a couple of things that I learn every right. time, and I've, I'm at six already, and wow. that's more than I've ever written down on, on, a, on a podcast before. So. Yeah, I didn't know you could count that high. Yeah. <laughs> really? Got on to another hand. So, Mac, why don't we – we've got a trivia question prepared okay. for you, Barry. Today's trivia is brought to you by Sheffield Financial. Explore swift, effortless, and convenient financing for power sports, outdoor power equipment, and trailers. Fueling your pursuits in hunting, fishing, and gamekeeping. More details at SheffieldFinancial.com. Yeah, we love Sheffield. They help us out a bunch. And so, Barry, the way this thing works is Mac, we, I'm, I'm probably taking Mac's spot here, but uh, our listener has already won a prize. You're playing for a prize for you and for – I'm going to go ahead and say Carol could win one too. We'll send, oh, my goodness. We'll send two <laughs> podcast T-shirts home with you. Wow. So, Mac, why don't you take it from here? All right, Mr. Barry. So, our podcast listener that left us a review is H-Z-Z-H-H-S-B-S-H that left us a review. Thank you for the review. So, you're going to win – Two houndstooth turkey talk turkey calls, and we'll send them to you. You know what does that name mean? Does it mean anything, Mike? Is that code for something? Not that I know of. Okay, I was hoping it would. I figured you were hoping it was. Uh, All right, Mister Barry. So the question for you is: How many species of black bass are in the state of Alabama, which I would assume are in the in the southeast? Okay, we've just got a new black bass that's named okay so that adds another thing to it. we have a large mouth we have the spotted bass uh we have the uh, coosa bass and over in east alabama there's also a shoal bass in the, in the small mouth which is really restricted to the tennessee river yeah, I thought I thought, we, I thought we might sneak that small mouth one in there on it but <clears throat> Yeah, that, that was silly. I mean, the people that published that will call him to find out what the heck is the number. So that was not yeah. that wasn't too difficult. That's no. okay. I'm, I'm, I hope, hope I passed without Don here to give me some coaching. <laughs> yeah, so you get two podcast T-shirts wow. to take back home. So. Wow. 
Cool. Yeah. Carol will be thrilled. Well, yeah, that's worth a, a, a eight hour drive. Yeah, you bet sure. for sure. <laughs> so, sure. what what should we be asking you? What if, what is there yeah, something what are those else? Mistakes? That's a good question to ask that question. What are the most common it mistakes? Is. It is well. I think we've covered most of them. Uh, you know, one thing is is uh, people disregard the the actual impact that stocking has in a new lake. Okay. Now I'm going to get a leader over to bring me some bass. Now I'll, get, I'll, I'll catch some bluegill out of my other pond and put it in here. You know, it's, it's just a big mistake. I mean, you, you can ruin a pond from the beginning by, for instance, just trying to save some money and stocking some adult bass in there. Okay, because first of all, you don't know what strain they are. That can be important. But the secondly is that you can't control the numbers once they spawn. You know, I'm going to tell Toxie, I'm going to stock 50 per acre in his new lake. So you put one pair of bass in there, you could end up with 500 per acre. And then they don't grow off. That's right. These bass ain't growing. Well, they don't have enough to eat. You know, you got too many of them in there to begin with. So that's that's one of the first things. And then... Stocking any other fish from the river in there is a big mistake. And so, you know, whether you got somebody that wants to put some crappie in there or whatever, or sometimes they'll just think they're helping you out. I see a lot of similarities, you know, in, in food plotting and stuff like, you know, establishing native grasses and wildflowers. Right. Exactly. You, you got to, I mean, you, you, you spend all this time and, and money building a pond, yeah, you know, do it right the first time. Really? You know, the, yeah, adding the fish is is a much lesser expense than building a dam. It a, is a complete yeah. parallel to deer, especially. And we've learned that you can't just have a place with deer and all of a sudden plant a bunch of great food plots and supplemental feed them, and boom, that summer they put on these great horns. I mean, if they're really going to express something exceptional. They have to be healthy and nutritionally taken care of from the time they're born. That's right. And you're telling us the same thing about fish. If That's you right. ever start out wrong, I mean, I, I still remember you saying too, I mean, this is other, another piece of advice that when you do stock, if you can kind of catch some that first year, if you can kind of keep up with those first fish that you stocked and be sure they go back because they got more at a young age than you'll ever get from the rest of them. And you're probably going to catch your biggest fish by one of those growing up simply because they had all that perfect nutrition as a child, so to speak, or a fingerling. And you can't just throw a bunch of nutrition in the, in a pond at a later date and do any good to speak of. Not like that. So yeah. that's the parallel I see between that and deer. Very, very similar to growing yeah. a trophy. Yeah. It starts when they're born. And actually, it talks, I owe you an apology. What's that? Uh -uh. Well, I didn't think you were paying attention to anything I told you back in the day. <laughs> you know, paying attention, I did. Uh, adhering to it, the discipline, sometimes I don't. <laughs> oh, my goodness. i tell you what, I've enjoyed having Barry and Clyde here today. Oh, yeah. We, we get Clyde. So. Well, we're just glad to be here, too. <laughs> I wonder if he does that and, and uses Bobby for the name when he's <laughs> in another place. He probably, probably, he probably calls our office and, and <laughs> acts like Clyde. <laughs> Barry, you got uh, you got a son. You got some some grandchildren. I do. Uh, uh, Nothing like it. Yeah, like boy, it, they. You know what? A great uh, grandfather. They've got to <laughs> to take them fishing and hunting and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. But don't get me started on that because you know we don't have time. All these kids nowadays, well, we're playing, well, we start baseball. Yep. Well, we just got through with basketball. Well, we got, you know. Soccer. Got, soccer. Yep. Well, we got all these things. It's a lot more complicated than it was when I was growing up. Yeah, we just went fishing. Yeah. 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 Life's busy, Barry. But I tell you what, you I, I've always been impressed with the way you t conduct your business and the way you handle yourself. You're just a, you're a good guy. And we, we're the best. We're blessed to have known you. Well, I'm blessed to have known you guys too. So this is good. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the flattery for, you know, trying to get me to come Bobby, back. Bobby <laughs> and Bobby's trying to get into one of the ponds. I know what you're doing. You ought to see him work a guy over has got a really good turkey lease. <laughs> Lord have mercy, Barry. You I see know. what I have to put up with? I do, Bobby. I do. Dudley, you got anything else we need to ask? I had one question, uh, and I'm sure folks ask you this. Uh 
what's like the smallest pond you would recommend for you know to get the full experience that's a good question Dudley. that is a good question Dudley. and uh, normally we look at it this way okay if, if you've got something that's going to be larger than a half acre okay you can support a blue eagle and bass pond if it's smaller than that then i would probably steer you in another direction because it's hard enough to keep the balance Mm-hmm. going on in that pond between the number the ratios of the bass and the bluegill keeping everything healthy and reproducing and growing at a good rate if you get smaller than a half acre it's really difficult to do okay that. good to know mac you got anything else you want to ask you're good rob wake up over there i tell you this has been <laughs> this has been really you know we've we've we talk fish ponds occasionally right. and um I, I tell you, I just find it fascinating. Well, I, we all love this topic. I love this topic, but I'll I'll say I I'm guessing Bobby loves this topic more than anybody at Mossy Oak Biology. He absolutely adores fishing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I tell you what, fishing with Barry is so educated. I've been blessed to go with him, and he's teaching just like he is now. He's teaching the whole time that he's not fussing at you about something. So. <laughs> Well, we probably you, need a little fussing. Too. If you, well, yeah, Bobby, if you had learned to cast at least as good as your daughter, you'd be okay. There we go. I, I get that. I get that a lot. So I tell you one last thing, yeah, because I asked you to do this. Have you got a good fish story you could tell us real quick? I got a good turkey story. Well, I do. Even better. Yeah. Even better. I mean, this is the time of the year to think about all those things. But you, you remember a guy that worked for the uh, Department of Conservation, the Game and Fish, named Paul Maddox? I do, yes. Okay, well, Paul was regarded as probably one of the top turkey hunters in the whole division, okay? And he worked for the director, Charles Kelly, worked directly under him. And so he did whatever Charles needed him to do. But during the turkey season, you couldn't, you couldn't find him because he was in the woods every day. Just like Toxie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, but part of his job was to was to carry these people that, that Charles, his boss, thought would be influential to help the department out. And so he, he, he harvested his limit every year, but then you could add another dozen or more on top of that for who he called in birds for other people. So when I first started turkey hunting, I was a young guy there in the department, and uh, I'd never been before that year, so I I went out and I harvested my first turkey, okay? And uh, I think that was one of those turkeys, as we all know, that we've hunted enough that were just very suicidal in tendencies. He just came up by himself, really, and, and and I harvested him. But I didn't have anybody, any mentor, to tell you. A lot of people would talk to me, but I never had anybody carry me hunting. So Paul, one day, he said, uh, look, uh, boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you out myself, okay? And, uh, man, I was so excited. And, and so he says, uh, I said, well, what time do we have to get up? Oh, I'm not, I'm not taking you in the morning now. I don't, I don't do that, but I'll take you tomorrow. But I'll just be ready to go about lunchtime. I said, lunch? Hey, you, can't, you call up a turkey at lunch? He said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we can do that. So anyway, we met there at lunch, and it was a place down in uh, Wilcox County had a lot of turkeys, you know, Pine Barren Creek kind of bordered part of the property down there. And so anyway, we went, and we kept walking, walking and walking, and finally we got to this place there. There was this big, big, huge pine tree. He said, yeah, I think this is far enough. So we sat down there, and he said, now, look, you— you know I ain't got but one eye. I said, yeah, I understand. Well, I got to sit on this side over here so I can see. I said, okay. So uh, anyway, we he said, now, if, if we hear a bird gobble, pretty good chances I'm going to call him up. We'll kill him. I said, all right. So he started off, you know, a little three-yelp soft thing, a little five-yelp, pretty soft. Nothing. Nothing, I thought. This is exactly, maybe this is like snipe hunting. I don't know. I mean, maybe he just lured me into this thing. And so, so he, you know, Paul used a, he used a Loman box. All you old timers know what that is. Mm-hmm. Toxic too. And he, but he had him a little special cedar striker. Loman box comes with a solid piece of cedar that you strike on that thing. But this was a box. So it was a box on a box. And so he, man, he got on that thing. 
And I mean, he started talking turkey with the thing, and it carried all the way down to Pine Level Creek. Well, sure enough, before he even finished that series, come on, gobble way down in there, you know. He said, there he is. I said, yeah, I heard him. He said, well, we're just going to wait here just a minute or two, and then we're going to call again. So he waited about, it seemed to me like 30 minutes, but it probably was just five. And so he he got down on that box again, and before he finished that call, that turkey gobble, he said, he's coming. He's coming. He's a lot closer. He said, now, now you get ready. Get your gun up. He's going to, there's a little, little, not a creek, but just a little wet weather thing down there. He's going to come around the end of that thing. He's come on, come, come on your side. That's why I put you over there. I said, okay, I appreciate that, Paul. Great. It's, it's great. I'm so excited. So anyway, he, he starts calling. You could hear the bird coming. You know, he was getting closer and closer and closer. And then finally he gets up there and he said, Oh my God, he's gonna see us. I gotta shoot him. Boom! Is <laughs> <laughs> his last name Cole? Yeah. So anyway, he killed, he killed this thing. Well, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not the smartest guy around, but, but in retrospect, I got to thinking about this thing and I thought, you know, I was wondering why the base of that tree was all cleaned out. Not, not a, no leaves, no brush, no yeah. nothing around there. I said, you know, I bet that rascal has called from this same tree before. Then I got to think about it. I said, and I bet most of the birds he killed came on his side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a Bobby story. So yeah. anyway, oh that, was my, that was my, um, I remember that experience. And just like all of you who've harvested turkeys and hunted turkeys, hundreds of times, you know, you go out and you have wonderful experiences. Oh, yeah. There. And so, you know, you, you just can't remember all those, but I certainly remember that one. Mm. I remember working at the outhouse in Montgomery and, Paul Maddox, man, you just brought in a turkey that had a beard that had a couple of hairs that went 16 inches. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Man. I think oh, it may be like Picasso. the longest beard in Alabama. May but. have been shot from the same pine tree. Yeah, <laughs> so I got I got one more for you. Okay. And be honest, what's yeah. the biggest bass you've had a customer grow? You don't have to say where it was, but what's the biggest bass you know one of your clients grew? 15 pounds, 4 ounces. <laughs> Boy, that's a hog. That's a hog. That's a hog. Make a big old fillet, wouldn't it, Dudley? Yeah, and we'll talk <laughs> about where this was afterwards, if you know. That's a big fish, Doug. Yeah, yeah it's, it's huge. huge. <laughs> All right, guys, this has been fun. Barry, thank you for coming. Yeah. Welcome. We're going to really story. close it out this time. Lanny, you missed a lot. I know. We'll catch you up. Super intriguing. Basically, stay, keep those river fish in the river. I mean, I want. I think I want a little bit of everything in there now. No, you don't. No, you don't. All right. Walleye. We're going all walleye. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Rob. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.